August 2003, I hired a Cessna float plane to fly up the coast of Vancouver Island to visit the cutting edge. This is the horrific interface where modern humans are destroying the last vestiges of the Earth's most priceless, magnificent ancient forests. This is a trip to what's left of wilderness, a place where the ancient cycles of the Earth continue to function according to the balances of nature, places as yet beyond, just beyond, the onslaught of human industrial devastation. Here on Vancouver Island, they've been logging for 150 years. They started here on South Island, and now they've cut more than 80% of the island's ancient primeval forests. What we're flying over here is all second growth, as far as the eye can see. It took them 120 years to cut the first half of the island's forests. With the new industrial forestry techniques, they've pretty much stripped all the rest off in the last 30 years. Now they're cutting into the second pass. They're cutting unplanted, naturally regenerated trees, which sprouted out of the original clear cuts. Certainly, the trees do grow back in these places, but these are not wild forests at all anymore. These forests are being utterly transformed and simplified by modern forest management. This is all about fiber per year per hectare forestry. Nowadays, they're taking out trees as young as 30 years old down here, and with their herbicide, chemical fertilization, and dreadfully, imminent GMO programs, it looks like they'll be taking off the fiber every year with lawnmowers, the way things are going. The first pass, many of the enormous Douglas fir groves were a thousand years old or more, but those trees are long gone now, and this biogeoclimatic zone's forest primeval has been exterminated. Let's have a look at what's been happening to the Vancouver Island marmots up in the hills beyond the massive forest-consuming Harmac pulp mill here. This first map shows the forest cover in the mountains where the city of Nanaimo gets its drinking water. Not much was known about the Vancouver Island marmots back then, whose alpine colonies are here represented by the pink dots. Fast forward a few decades and see the forest getting stripped off, the new clear cuts represented here in brown, moving right up the mountainsides towards the marmot colonies. The red dots seen here represent clear cuts directly next to the colonies. In 2003, while throwing a few bucks at the marmot recovery program, Weyerhaeuser and Timberwest continue to strip millions of dollars in timber from the surrounding forests. And it's not only the marmots which are in trouble. The island's deer, elk, wolves, and cougar, as well as the salmon, are all in trouble. As recently as 1968, the Nanaimo River was the second most productive steelhead river in the world, only surpassed by the Cowichan River. Now, during the winter rains, the river runs too turbid, even for the Harmac pulp mill, which has to switch to groundwater. As we're flying up the west coast of the island, we're passing these awesome forested watersheds, valleys like the Carmana, and here, the Walburn, where public outrage and demonstrations, direct action battles with road blockades and mass arrests prevented the onslaught of destruction, which has brought ruination to almost all of the others. Of 90 or so primary watersheds over 5,000 hectares of, on the island, 84 have been eroded and gutted by industrial clear-cut logging. Just this year, the 75-year-old great-grandmother Betty Croswick barricaded valiantly a road in the Walburn Valley for 15 days before she was finally arrested and thrown in jail, where she stays to this day. In these few remaining watersheds here, where people have persisted for thousands of years, these are the intact wildernesses we're trying to protect.
This is the Klanawa Valley, and this is the cutting-edge work of the American clear-cutting giant, Weyerhaeuser, operating here in the public forest. These 40-hectare clear-cuts are what passes for state-of-the-art forestry in the collusive boardrooms of the BC government and its big business buddies. This mountain was clear-cut right to the beach in 1980 by the transnational logging giant Interfor. This kind of logging on public lands, lands which of course were stolen from First Peoples, was approved by government foresters. Interfor likes to point out how well the mountain is greening up, but check out the beginnings of this slide here. This is what comes next. The St. Paul's Dome landslide is Vancouver Island's ugliest logging scar. We have to fly nearly all the way to the northern end of Vancouver Island, which is about the size of Denmark, before we can find any significant tract of intact, unlogged wilderness. The Brooks Peninsula is an enormous mystical and remote promontory, which juts right out into the stormy North Pacific waters. Parts of the Brooks remained ice-free during the last ice age, when glaciers covered all the rest of the island glaciers which have been receding over the past 10,000 years. The Brooks is widely recognized as being a primeval refugia, a place where over eons of time an astonishing biodiversity gradually evolved into the natural splendor that it is today. 200 years ago, Captain Cook's first sight of North America was Solander Island. The people who inhabited this area for more than 10,000 years have now receded from this landscape. The cutting edge of industrial logging is now advancing into East Creek, Vancouver Island's last unprotected wild watershed. This is our destination, and we're going to land here and have a look around. The harbors afforded protection from the incessant Pacific storms, and the villages were sighted so as to provide long vistas over the harbor entrances so that visitors could be seen approaching. Fresh water was in the immediate vicinity and each village presided over a large clam flat where food could simply be picked up right off the beach at low tides. These shell middens were the compost heaps of these ancient villages where over the centuries people piled up the shells after use. To me, when I look over these ancient historical sites where human beings once lived in symbiotic balance as participants in the evolution of their environment I see the very highest form of human civilization, where after millennia, their only ecological footprint are these thimbleberry bushes growing from the middens surrounding their building sites. Of course, it's impossible to just pass by such fabulous huckleberry bushes. Many people have found the going very tough while hiking off trail in these primeval forests with so many obstacles such as entire tracts of massive wind-thrown trees which have been blown down in the storms. The weather can be very extreme in this area, which is often referred to as Vancouver Island's Cape Horn. Personally though, my biggest obstacle to forward progress is getting through these berry bushes. Once you start eating them, you can never stop, and this certainly costs in distance travel per hour. At this time of year, in late August, just before the salmon start to run up the rivers, the bears are all doing the same. As one enters such a forest, one is struck by an amazing sense of peace and tranquility, a timelessness and stability which has allowed these plants to just slowly continue to grow over centuries. People have used the big tree for shelter, and I believe that the scorch marks inside it are human-caused perhaps to excavate the large cavity within for that very purpose. In fact, last summer, a friend and I sheltered in it during a powerful rainstorm which blew in off the Pacific. We got a small fire going from tinder dry wood inside and passed the time comfortably while the storm ranged outside. Animals depend on these large trees for shelter too, and many of them have large, warm, and dry, cozy dens in their trunks there can be none of this essential shelter for wildlife in the post-clear-cut forest. So we're here in this forest just uh, 
a little bit away from the uh, Klaskish uh, Indian village where we've been staying. And uh, this is like their woodlot. There's these uh, large cedar trees in the forest here, and, and many of them have uh, evidence of bark stripping or plank stripping, or even uh, there's stumps. In fact, there's stumps all the way along the shore here. There's a plank strip. And it's quite an interesting one because it has plank strip from two different planes off the tree. So uh, down here you can see the remnants of the, the, the plank of the bottom notch. And they would have chiseled out a notch in here so they could fit their wedges in and start splitting off these chunks. This callus here, I think is probably new growth in the last hundred years or so that started to wrap itself around, but they would have had a clear shot up to about that branch there. And it's possible they might have taken, you know, four or five planks off of here. Now on this side, you can see the, the bottom notch down here, and they've taken a plank or two or three or however many off of this side. So we've got a nice 45 degree here with planks coming off here and planks coming off here. And what's so fabulous about this woodlot is that these trees have given uh, a plank or two and they're just uh, growing away and uh, one day, you know, perhaps uh, a plank could come off here and a notch could be cut in here and we've got a nice clear strip along here, branch free, that uh, could produce some more planks. So what we're looking at here is a culturally modified tree and it's uh, quite an interesting one because as is well known on the southeast uh, coast of Vancouver Island, the First Nations used to uh, chip the bark off the base of large fir trees, Douglas fir trees, and then make a fire that would scorch the side of the tree. They didn't burn the tree down but just a, a scorch on the side of the tree which stimulates the run of pitch. But uh, there's been no knowledge of this same technique being used for Sitka spruce. Now this is a Sitka spruce tree, and uh, here you can see the modifications here. These are uh, stone tool markings from a stone adze, which would have been chiseling off into the, the, the wood of the tree here. And you can see the scorchings from the, the fire. And to this day, there's still pitch running off of the, this wound here. And uh, so this is quite significant. It dates it like, you know, a pre-metal. Uh, We're heading out from our camp today to explore the East Creek River and Estuary. The cutting edge has now advanced just this year into this priceless, magnificent, last unprotected primeval watershed on Vancouver Island. East Creek is a major salmon producing river and all six species of salmon return here to spawn. This is the salmon forest, a very special riparian ecosystem, with this floodplain being enriched not only by nutrients flowing down through the forested valley, but also from the ocean depths as the fish return to spawn, fully fattened after several years at sea. New research is discovering how bears and other animals attracted to the great salmon runs help carry this ocean nutriment away from the river and into the forest. Once there, they take a few bites and leave the rest to feed the trees. This is where Canada's tallest trees, the magnificent Sitka spruce grow, in riverside flats like this. In every single logged Vancouver Island Valley, these miraculous salmon runs have been decimated.
So we're now on the very western coast of Vancouver Island. The next stop that way is Japan. And uh, the problem is, is that these final frontiers of primeval forests, such as we've been walking through today, this is the end of it. What you can see on this, this mountain side here is the last face of primeval forest that's left on North America after 300 years of industrial logging. And that particular patch of forest on that hill is part of Interfor's tenure. And Interfor has a history of just cutting and clear cutting and with no sensitivity to the, the uh, visual aspects or the incredible wonder that that forest is. So we need to stop them from logging that. We need to have this western fringe of Vancouver Island set aside for uh, the last uh, fringes of our magnificent primeval forest. And here, back at today's cutting edge, is the new Interfor, which has been at work in this previously primeval valley since 1997. This is the final outrage, a 2003 live real-time crime against nature, an insult to humanity. This new road now being punched into East Creek. This is an incredibly steep mainline and it leads right into the hitherto pristine primeval watershed. This is what the logging plan is for East Creek, the same shotgun blast which has now taken the wild out of the class skiche. That's the four o'clock dynamite blast right there, and now where enduring peace and sacred silence of nature has pervaded for millennia. Constant daily blasting is now a regular feature of the soundscape. There is no dialogue, no discussion, no inquiry, no legal recourse to stop this. And it must be stopped. These forests contain the last intact natural ecosystems on the planet. They are priceless biological, genetic, historical, and spiritual treasure houses. As long as they exist, there remains an opportunity for humanity to relearn the ancient skills which enabled human civilizations to endure for millennia on this ever-changing landscape. We need to begin to relearn, to reintegrate the human presence back into the global environment as useful participants rather than as destroyers. 80% of Vancouver Island's magnificent primeval forests have been exterminated. Our society is cheapened by the loss of such forests. It's a tragic loss to the world. We need your help at the cutting edge. We need people to wake up now before it's too late.